This really great example is happening in Lake Victoria in Uganda and Tanzania, where pressure by the government as well as banks and in private investment have turned what was once an artisanal fishery into a largely commercial enterprise where the local fishers are no longer in charge of the resource or in charge of the operation. And the countries are doing this because it turns out that fish exportation to Europe now provides the greatest source of international revenue for both Tanzania and Uganda. That is exceeding revenues from coffee and tourism. And the the thing that I'm doing research on right now, which is really counterproductive, is the fishery is bringing more money into those two countries than the fishery ever has. But at the same time, poverty is increasing in the fisher communities as well as increasing malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Because when it was an artisanal fishery, people were able to bring home part of the catch for their families. Now to pay off loans and um, meet bank obligations or whatnot, or just working for people, they can bring none of it home, even the bycatch, because it's sold to the uh, pet industry for food. So if this has been going on for such a long time, the destruction of of, uh, public or common uh, resources, uh, I, I suppose one can make the argument that uh, that it's it's part of what humans do. In other words, that is that I get back to the is it inexorable that it's it's just going to happen. People uh, see forests and they cut them down. And they you know this is uh, they 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 see resources and they try to you know that there's a logic of depletion. You know this it gets back to Garrett Hardin, I suppose that that it's it's it, it's not just that it's a conspiracy of bad companies. It's the way people are in, con- when confronted with common resources. I have a feeling you don't see it that way, but what's, what's wrong with that picture? <laughs> I would resist mm-hmm. that view. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope it's not true. <laughs> it might mm-hmm. be true. Uh, simply because I have particularly looked at agriculture, uh, forests, and a little bit fisheries mm-hmm. because of where I did my first field work on, this, on, on the Bay of Bengal. Mm-hmm. And there were these artisanal uh, fish, fisher people. When I first went there in 1975, they were eating, they were doing exactly what you described. And now, I mean, very quickly it happened. Um, they, they got impoverished, yeah. bad nutrition, because everything is being sold exactly. uh, on the market and by these trawlers. And it's, of course, depleting yes. the source of fish. Yes. Uh, and it's happening in Kerala. Kerala, I don't know, but I've read about. But mm-hmm. in Orissa, mm, you know, Andhra, it's happening. Mm-hmm. And about agriculture, so my, my view, of course, I don't, I don't study evolution, so maybe mm-hmm. uh, I should pay more attention. But uh, my uh, horizon mm-hmm. is uh, much shorter, and uh, what I have witnessed or what I've learned about agriculture, forestry, fisheries is that once you bring in the market system uh, and the nation state, that's where the trouble Mm -hmm. begins. Mm -hmm. And that uh, in all these fields, I mean, they have been very well studied, you know, how the the forests were preserved. how agriculture in the Gangetic Plain was Mm -hmm. extremely sustainable for millennia. Um, The fishery is the same. They've been doing that for millennia as far as we know. Uh, And all of a sudden, very quickly, in a matter of a few years, it just goes to hell. And you have all these problems. So that's that's my uh, horizon and my understanding. And of course, you know, the the, the, pe- the plenty of people who have written about this. I mentioned Jim Scott, but there, right. you know, there are others. And uh, being an anthropologist, I mean, you know, we we look at the idea. Of, I mean. Uh, Hardin's is 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 uh, his case has to do with open access, free access, right. which never exists right. in uh, non-modern uh, collectivities, right. never. And what, in particular, I have focused on um, is the that in all these non-modern collectivities, the non-human 
be it the forest, the soil, mm -hmm. the sea, the fish, the animals, the plants, are part of the collectivity. The commons yes. are human, non-human, and mm -hmm. this commonality is is concretized and made uh, powerful through beings mm -hmm. that, uh, such as spirits, deities, mm -hmm. ghosts, right. demons, etc., that um, embody that entanglement right. of the human and the non-human and make very strict rules that people respect. Right. Because otherwise you have the, uh, the spirits or the deities on your back yeah. and the uh, people respect, or t you know, and then of course things happen yes. and that falls apart. But if, you, if, if, if one takes, let's say, from, um, well, I, I shouldn't speak like that, but certainly uh, you know, what happened with the British and the yes. forest and agriculture yes. uh, has been a disaster. Yeah. I mean, the Green Re Revolution has been not only an ecological disaster, but a social disaster, total social disaster. In, in what sense? In India. Um, to make the Green Revolution work, you need much more input. You need irrigation. Mm -hmm. You need, uh, you know, certain uh, economies of s scales, yes. uh, inputs, uh, agrochemicals, mm -hmm. pesticides. So you've had a great development of uh, dams and irrigation mm -hmm. in Punjab, let us say. Well, that has led ecologically to the salin salinization mm. of a huge amount of land, yes. huge amount of land. And then socially, uh, the, the, the small farmers was bought out by the big farmer right. Right. who had the cash exactly. to expand and make economies of scale. And, uh, and what has been happening in India for the last two decades is an epidemic of suicide mm -hmm. of farmers mm -hmm. because they get so indebted Mm -hmm. for all these inputs. And, you know, there's such a push from the government extension agent to buy the hybrid and genetically modified. Mm -hmm. And then they have to buy... And, and, of course, there's no regeneration. Right. You know, there are suicide seeds. Uh, that mm -hmm. got invented in Iowa in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the heart of the Green Revolution. And, uh, you know, that goes against practice of farmers, millenarian practice of saving seeds. Uh, and creating, of course, a market. So, uh, with you know having to buy all these inputs, mm -hmm. they can't make it. So that sustainable and and meshing that you first described uh, uh, is 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 disruptive, disrupted by these market and political forces. Exactly. And then those get called natural. Then the only way the, the, the way it has to be. But in fact, what what you, researchers have shown in, in many of these contexts is, no, there are other modes yeah, other of sustainability modes. that were working prior to their disruption. Absolutely. And it sounds like you've studied right. similar kinds of patterns. Yeah. Let, let me just put a point on what Frederic had said, mm -hmm. and then I'll frame things in a way that maybe disagrees a little bit or takes a slightly different point of view. But in India, for example, for the last five to ten years, India has been growing in excess excess food, mm -hmm. and yet the rate of malnutrition and people who starve to death is huge in the multiple millions of people per year. And like your fishery example exactly. before, right? Exactly. It's, the it's the same thing. So more money is coming from agriculture, but yet starvation and uh, malnutrition increase because of both distribution and because people are too poor to buy the food that they once grew themselves. Okay. So. Let me uh, look at your question about is about whether it's human or not mm -hmm. and how we relate to the commons. And I'll first start with that quote from Karl Marx that said, nature is nothing if not for the um, bounty of man. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have this philosophy, but people have looked at it for a very long time. Um, lots of work has shown that the original aboriginal peoples um, who inhabited Australia uh, 
over 14,000 years ago, took a continent that had mature forest with large animals and burned it to the ground. The desert outback that we see today um, is due to the fact that these people um, denuded that mm-hmm. entire landscape and turned it through a positive feedback loop into a very, very large dry desert uh, mm-hmm. or arid area. Yeah. If we think about I, I would like to think, and a thesis that I'm working on, and, and it certainly supports the examples that Frederic has brought up, but, but then puts a limitation on them, is that I think people live sustainably, we can find examples of sustainable living with the landscape where productivity um, exceeds the number of people living there. So in the Gangetic Plain and through the Ganges until the number of people were so large, and certainly before the commercialization, the number of fish being produced by natural processes exceeded the demand on those items. But let's now go to the um, high areas of of Bolivia and at the edge of Peru to the Altiplano, which of course was also a high deciduous forest until 1,500 years ago when Chip Stanish at UCLA demonstrated that the people cut cut this down and it led to this very dry plain. But uh, the farming around Lake Titicaca by Myron and other Incan ancestors um, shows very well that what the people did um, was they farmed in a way that was unsustainable, increased salinization of the soils through there, and then moved. And what happened was is all these people were moving around the lake, destroying the areas that they had lived in, and when they came in close proximity, these big wars started. Again, the work of Chip Stanish and, and others. And so the whole point is, I think that there's lots of examples of people having unsustainable practices. I think Mm -hmm. part of being human is like actually every other organism on the planet. Everything modifies its environment. And I think this takes the guilt off of us. What we're doing today is actually happening at a faster rate because of current technology. But as technologies have progressed through human time, the rate of modification of these landscapes, diminution of common resources, has just accelerated. But let me just make sure I understand one thing, because uh, about population growth. I mean, uh, that was Hardin's big worry, right? In other words, that sure, everything would be okay, except that the demand by humans is going to exceed the planet's capacity because, because there's more of us. And in your examples, that seems like you because when population was lower, it was okay, but once population, is it population that puts the pressure on, on humans to um, go from these more sustainable practices to things that are, are going to be, in the long run, counterproductive? Well, I think it, that's a, it's a combination of things. The, the examples in olden times when populations were lower is just that people had unsustainable practices, but there, was, there were a lot of resources to move into. Yeah, you just go to so the next one. Just, <laughs> go to the, just go to the next one, yeah. and, and either it recovers or it didn't. And so in, in around... Um, Titicaca, it hasn't recovered. But in places like the Amazon, you can go everywhere, and anthropologists and ethnobotanists have determined that peop- what we see today, even in the most, in quotes, pristine form, has been modified by ancient humans. They, right. they have lived everywhere. But it recovered in some yeah. sort of a way. But what happens now is that A, we're running out of space. B, the amount of pressure on common resources, soils, water, food, um, to to feed a larger population is exacerbated by state demands Mm. for international trade, for making profits. So to take more out of the resource than just sustenance or maintaining it. Because if you think about the modern articles of incorporation with investors, it's to maximize the profits right. or to the return to an investor. And that says nothing about perpetuity or sus- yeah. sustainability. Well, this gets back exactly. to your first example, right? Where yeah. you have the confluence of state forces exactly. and commercial or corporate exactly. forces. And my guess is, from what you've said so far, Frederick, that for you, it's th- those 
accelerators or uh, of of unsustainability, they may be more important than population growth in terms of screwing up this this what had been a manageable uh, system. I, I agree. I mean, as as Barry pointed out in India, so, so now you have enough food to feed everybody, but you have the same number of people starving. Yeah. Uh, so it's not the we do have enough food to feed everybody. Mm -hmm. It's the system and how it distributes them or doesn't distribute it. I mean, inequality is growing everywhere yes. in the global north, in the global south, in the U.S. Yes. I mean, that's what Occupy Wall Street was all about. Mm -hmm. So I think what we've talked about so far uh, has been very helpful in both uh, helping uh, us all see. Uh, some of the things we know about the commons and, and why we should care about the destruction of the commons. I mean, we've both given very important examples about um, the, the really poisonous effects that, the undermi uh, that undermining the commons have on communities uh, in different parts of the world. With uh, this, the, the think tank, I'm engaged in writing for the first time a book not for an academic I press. I see. So what are you writing about? <laughs> well, on, on uh, recreating this uh, pre-Columbian Amazonian soil of millenarian fertility that huh. is still fertile today. It hasn't been touched since the, inv the Spanish invasion. So it's really uh, the most sustainable soil in the world. Huh. And it's, of course, it's totally rewriting the history of the Amazon basin. So I'll tell that story because it's working. I haven't been tested by uh, scientific means, yeah. but the crops are four, the times, crops are <laughs> four times the size wow. on degraded land that, where the forest would not regrow. And of course, it's permanent agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, because the local agriculture is Sweden, slash and burn, mm -hmm. which is bad for many reasons. So, so I want to tell that story. But uh, for the think tank, um, particularly, I, I would like us, I think Barry mentioned it at the beginning, that you know so much of our um, thought. I tend to think of it as modern thought, or since the since the 16th, 17th century, that we think of humans that that nature is out there. It's yes. a given. There it is, and it's a background to our action. That's yeah. the mainstream view of history. Yes. We need to change that. We need to make to make it uh, graspable uh, and uh, and motivate people. Mm -hmm. We have our being uh, through yeah. this constitutive outside, mm -hmm. so-called outside. We're part of it, yes. and you know, the water, the soil, the sun, the air, everything uh, is part of us. And once. And we need to to communicate this in an effective way yes. and in an, in a way that moves people. Yes. I mean, yes, the head is necessary, but not sufficient yes. in my view. No, I have a very good point. <laughs> we need the head, but if we cannot move people and make them, you know, their kishka, their yeah. guts, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Well, this is why the, the, the why we should care part that's you know, right. for us, too. And, 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 and I think that's been a big part of the College of the Environment uh, that's from, right. from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, our mission simply is to change the world. And, you know, part of the outcomes of this think tank are not only um, wonderful articles being published by each of the members, as well as a collective book that... Um, that is being spearheaded by Professor Goslinga, um, who's sort of heading up the think tank. But our goal really is to bring these issues out and, and what we can do with this worldwide. And I think that um, there's a lot for indivi that individuals can do around the world to get involved in this. And one of it, one of the most important ways, is to work with. Um, people who are associated with these common resources at, and try to um, talk with them about their relationship to those resources and to mobilize political pressure for the rights of individuals um, 
to have access to those resources in a way that's sustainable. So, mm-hmm. for, for example, um, we did this with Bolivian um, fishers by showing them, in fact, that their catch depended on maintenance of the forest along um, these big river systems. Mm-hmm. And, and then these Bolivian fishers um, banded together to actually demonstrate uh, to the government and prevented the lumber companies from deforesting mm-hmm. the areas mm-hmm. that were affecting these river systems and the reproductive capacity of the fishes that they depend upon. Right. So that was very effective. But the other thing that we need to do, so that's one level yeah. where individuals can um, can work. But another really important level is we need to find ways in both our education systems and in through our elected or unelected leaders mm-hmm. to have discussions at at different uh, governmental levels to ask the question about what are what is the social contract mm-hmm. between individuals and the government and where do these resources l- lie? Mm-hmm. Um, and how do we come with a fair distribution of equity? Mm-hmm. It's true that companies are not going to invent new ways of interacting with these resources in many ways, in a, in a sense, to protect them. A mm-hmm. conundrum, for example, is if we can grow agriculture in a more effective way in the lands that are already committed to agriculture, then we don't have to destroy other types of right. natural area to increase the crops, which is right. makes the biochar and these mm-hmm. black earth systems so appealing right. is because it's done without hydrocarbons <coughs> um, and fossil fuels. Right. So it's, it's cheap, it's not a dependent way. Mm-hmm. So I think we really need a multi-pronged approach, both at the level of working with the um, artisanal people to learn to protect their own resources mm-hmm. and also working um, with our elected leaders or even unelected leaders to start discussing this relationship that the state has in um, with people and with the resources upon which the people depend.